So good morning, Lex Scott. Thank you so much for joining us for USU's Teach In for Racial Justice, which is part of a nationwide effort on college campuses to raise awareness of systemic racism and white supremacy. Um, Lex Scott is the founder of Black Lives Matter Utah and the United Front Civil Rights Organization. Lex, I'm so honored to be speaking with you this morning. Thank you for having me. Go Aggies. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so, I'd like to start out with a question about, about um, the, the history of Black Lives Matter. The movement was started seven years ago in 2013 uh, by three Black women, Patrice Coulors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi, in the wake of George Zimmerman's acquittal for the murder of Trayvon Martin and uh, following the murder of Eric Garner at the hands of police. And you've been involved in this movement from the very beginning. I know you were in Ferguson after the murder of Michael Brown. Um, can you describe the evolution of this movement from its founding seven years ago to the current moment? Yes. Um, well, I believe that the movement began with Trayvon and Mike Brown and Ferguson. Um, we might have a little different definitions on who founded the movement. Mm. Uh, my, my Apologies, please educate me. <laughs> well, no, my opinion is that Mike Brown, Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice founded the movement. Um, our chapter is an independent chapter. In Ferguson, um, the Ferguson Police Department had over-policed their residents and 90% of them had active warrants for their arrest. And when Darren Wilson murdered Mike Brown, it was the last straw and the city erupted. Um, the majority of the protests were peaceful protests. And um, of course, we believe the riot is the language of the unheard. We, we mourn broken bodies, not broken buildings. And then people took the movement back home to their cities. Every city uh, pretty much has some kind of a Black Lives Matter entity or chapter. Um, some are independent, some are part of the national network of Black Lives Matter. Um, and, you know, each city does different things. Some, some try to run for office to affect, you know, legislation and police reform there. Some cities protest a lot. Some cities have homeless outreach that I've, I've talked to. And in Salt Lake City, we tried to be a full service civil rights organization. Um, mostly we've been ignored for seven years. People like you at Utah State who've been bringing me out for three years to talk about this, we appreciate you for being here before people recognize the movement. And what I've seen is protests for seven years with very little change. I believe this legislative session, we're going to have some change. I'm very excited about that. Um, but you know, we have, we've been ignored. We've had doors slammed on our face. We've been told we're too controversial. Um, and it is so hard to change the system. So, you know, in the movement right now, I do believe there are a lot of, I mean, when I saw the movement blow up in June, mm -hmm. um, you know, my first thought was, I was very fearful that the wrong people were coming, that this was trendy, that there are a lot of bandwagon people who don't understand the movement. I was right. <laughs> um, we've always pushed for quality over quantity. Um, and, you know, and a lot of us are like, okay, I can't wait for this to die down again so that um, we have the quality people because we know the bandwagon people, some of them have already left. You know, they flooded to our website to hurry and sign up what can I do? I want to protest right now. Ah! And then, um, then we see people unsubscribing from the website. Oh, it's not trendy enough for you now. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at. So the, yeah. And to build on that. So the movement gained really tremendous momentum this summer, um, in the wake of the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, um, can you talk about why it's more important than ever for us to acknowledge the importance of black lives? Well, I feel like it, you're right. It, it's, it's very important right now. It's always been important. Um, but police target black people. 
Okay, they profile us, they pull us over at five to 10 times the rate of white people. They give us higher sentences for lesser crimes. They kill us and they are not held accountable for that. Um, we are profiled, um, we are followed around in stores, we are denied housing because of the color of our skin, we are denied jobs because of the color of our skin. And our focus here is we've sat here for seven years watching police murder black people with the, with the world saying nothing, doing nothing. And, and all we've ever wanted is a fair and equal justice system in which white police officers cannot shoot black people in the back. They cannot shoot unarmed people. They cannot say, oh, this man had a warrant. This man had a criminal record. Therefore, we shot him and the world says, oh, well, well, he shouldn't have had a criminal record. No, we believe if you have a criminal record a mile long, you deserve to make it to court. If you have warrants, you deserve to make it to court. Police are not judge, jury, and executioner. And so we have seen this injustice. And finally, people are finally listening to us and saying, you know what? There should be police accountability and transparency. Police should not be allowed to investigate themselves and find themselves innocent. Um, these families of police brutality victims deserve their day in court as well. And no one wants to acknowledge these police brutality victims are winning in civil court. Um, they, I mean, the settlements, millions upon millions of dollars are paid out per year. And the world just kind of turns a blind eye. But these families would give back every penny if they could just have real justice or their children back. Their children, you know. Um, and so, yeah. We need people to pay attention and, and don't, don't forget about this movement because the movement's never going to end until we get justice. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, there, there, as you mentioned, you, you, you have some ambivalence about the growing support for the movement. Some of it is probably um, very authentic and there's a, a, a genuine willingness among some to, to, to become more aware, educated about these issues. But there are some who, for whom, you know, businesses putting up Black Lives Matter and they haven't ever invested in hiring and, and promoting Black leaders, for example. Um, more recently, the NBA and other professional athletes held a multi-day strike following the brutal shooting in the back of Jacob, Jacob Blake. Um, do you see that this is, and some people are saying we're at an inflection point um, in terms of racial reckoning. From your vantage point, what do you see as the, as the potential impacts of this movement in the short term, while all eyes are watching, and in the long term? I hope that we can pass nationwide police reform. Um, there is a bill in Washington called the Justice in Policing Act. It is the dream bill. It already passed the House, I believe, and now it needs to pass the Senate. It has qualified immunity reform. It has a national police misconduct database. It ties police funding to police performance. Um, it has independent oversight of police misconduct, um, body cam footage policies. You know, it, it has everything I've ever wanted ever and no one is paying attention and no one is listening and if we if we take back the senate ha, <laughs> um i just pray i just hope and pray we can have this bill because you know we can pass police reform in utah but all black people in utah have relatives that live outside of Utah. And black people in Utah go on trips outside of Utah. And I, do, I won't feel successful in this if Utah is the only state that has the police reforms. But it is a big deal. It's a red state, yep. you know? And I keep saying, hey, congratulations, blue states that pass police reform. That's a cakewalk, okay? <laughs> I'm in a red state. And, and my hope is if we take one of the most conservative states in the union 
and we pass really good police reform here, maybe the world might listen and, and follow in our footsteps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've heard you say, and I've, I've seen you write, that while protest is really important, it's imperative that protest leads to changes in laws and institutions. And you've championed police reform bills nationally and statewide from the beginning. And you've cultivated very difficult relationships with law enforcement from the beginning. You've had conversations, tough conversations with law enforcement from the beginning. What do you think is the potential for police reform at the national level and at the state level right now? Well, they're, they're completely ignoring the Justice and Policing Act right now. They have moved on to other things. Um, and that is very disheartening. Um, I, I, do, I need to do something about it. You know, maybe I'll do some TikToks today about it, make some more videos about it. That's my only national platform is TikTok, you know. The, the nation listens to me on TikTok, but in Utah, they listen in Black Lives Matter. But um, I, I've said, if we pass this police reform in Utah, I am moving. And so I can try to affect police reform nationally, you know, moving to Washington, D.C. So I can just bug them until they do what I want, um, because I can't leave when we just have one state. So right now they're they're ignoring us um again we had some momentum and i don't know if they're waiting for the election to see if we do flip the senate um if we flip the senate it's game over um i'm sober but get your champagne um we're having a big party that day um because if we pass that act the face of policing in this nation will change do you see any openings in law enforcement right now? Is, is there a crack in, in the door of, do you see any law enforcement allies for the Justice and Policing Act? So, well, so I spoke with the Fraternal Order of Police, um, not yesterday, but the day before. And I told them about the bills that we want. They don't have a problem with those bills. Um, they believe in data collection they believe in having body cams for their police officers you know they you know they want to look deeper into which less than lethal weapons would be the best for their police department because i i believe i'm i'm the only leader of a black lives matter chapter who has pushed so hard for less than lethals in every patrol car <laughs> excuse me i believe that if every police officer had a less than lethal rubber bullet shotgun in their car um there would be less people dead and and so i have pushed for funding for that i pushed for funding for every police officer to have a body cam they believe in that and i said i don't want these agencies investigating each other and pretending like that's justice and not a conflict of interest and the Fraternal Order of Police said they've been pushing for an independent agency that would work full time just to investigate police misconduct and critical incidents. So when you bring Black Lives Matter to the table with police, you would be surprised how much we have in common. Um, they don't like the district attorney. We don't like the district attorney. Um, I don't, I don't see this man getting reelected and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. But they don't believe that Sim Gill is handling situations as well. Um, and so I see them coming to the table. The Department of Public Safety is holding weekly meetings with myself and legislator, legislatures about policy change and police reform. Um, I have police officers calling me telling me they appreciate our work. Um, I think that police are sick of the protests. They're sick of the riots. They're tired. Um, their halo is tarnished. Um, you know, the veil has come off of policing. They cannot pretend that they are heroes who are perfect any longer. Um, they have flaws and there is racial inequality within policing and police understand hey the only way 
we get our little halo back <laughs> is if we change the face of policing and we are held accountable for our actions. So um, yeah, police are on board. I know there are a lot of police officers that, that just hate Black Lives Matter and they want to pretend they're perfect and everything to that extent. And, and those are the police officers who, hey, we're coming for you. We're coming for um, your freedom to murder us without consequence and we won't stop until you're held accountable for your actions. I love this model you're building um, where, you know, I, th I think in the, in the kind of national conversation, it's often Black Lives Matter versus police, but I feel like your leadership embraces a vision, kind of a moral vision of a community level partnership between Black Lives Matter and law enforcement. And, and I think that gets us much further than this idea that, that these are kind of competing competing institutions or movements. Exactly. And I've been meeting with Republicans because it's a red state. You know, people, and I appreciate the Democrats throwing out the majority of police reform bills. I appreciate them. However, it's a red state. It's a Republican state. And I'm playing chess over here. So I am meeting with Republicans and Republicans, um, they they say the same thing. I said, hey, I want the power out of the district attorney's hands. I want all of those cases in the hands of a grand jury to investigate officer-involved shootings. And the Republicans are like, they have a problem with Simbio. I have met very few people who, <laughs> who don't have a problem with the district attorney. And, and, and so, you know, people want to pit Black Lives Matter against police. There are police in Black Lives Matter who are out here saying, yes, we need to be held accountable for our actions. Um, the world wants a civil war. Um, the media wants a civil war. It sells newspapers, it sells magazines, it, it's clickbait. Um, you know, there I get death threats every day. Today's was really fun. Um, and, you know, the world is, is so filled with hatred and rage right now. And I'm out here like, okay, you guys go over here, you do your little hatred and your rage, but you don't understand that there is a sleeper cell who is, who is out here changing the system. And one day you're going to wake up and the system has changed and, and you don't get your fun little civil war that you want, you know, cause I, we just changed the whole system. <laughs> That's the dream. Lex, I'm, I, you know, I, I and so many across the state have been really inspired by your leadership and, and picking up on what you just said, I, I, I have a little bit of awareness of the kinds of things you have to deal with by virtue of being the voice in the face of this movement in Utah. What sustains you? Um, well, hope. Mm -hmm. Hope. You know, that we finally have hope that in January things can change. Hope sustains me. My husband um, is the sweetest, most caring, loving man. My daughter is adorable with the cutest laugh in the whole world. My son tries to drive me crazy every day of my life. Um, and the police brutality victims' families. And thinking of Darian Hunt, um, you know... I made a promise to Darian's mom that I would get her justice because I was really naive and I was new to activism. And I said, Hey, I promise I'll get justice for you. Um, a promise I couldn't keep. And so I promised myself I would change the whole system. That's how I would get justice for Damien or for Darian. Um, and, and so if I change the system, I feel like, if, if there can't be more Darian hunts, then, then I, I haven't really kept my promise, but, but I, I would feel like I could sleep at night. <laughs> um, and, and I just have to think of, of Darian hunts, mom and Patrick Harmon and Bobby Duckworth's family and, um, Cindrea Europe and Elijah Smith. And you just have to think, okay, these families are destroyed. The, what these families go through is they get a phone call that um, their son or daughter is dead. The police tell them they can have the body after the autopsy and the police say they cannot discuss the case until the case is over. 
um, then the family will go see the body. A lot of the time it's not, they can't have an open casket um, for the funeral. And then they call the district attorney. The district attorney refuses to talk to the family until the case is over. The police won't talk to the family. And then they see the body cam footage is released on Facebook, on the media. And then they go in the comments and, and thousands of people are in the comments saying, I'm glad he's dead. What a thug. Um, the media pulls the criminal record before the body is cold to dehumanize the person in their death. And then the family um, has to watch their son or daughter be murdered over and over and over again. Um, and then Sim Gill comes out and says, this officer did the right thing in murdering your child. Um, they never see justice. They never get to say goodbye. They never see another birthday. And that's what drives me. People, you know, a few weeks ago, this activist I work with said, I really love how much you love your people and, and how your activism is driven by love. And I think that's beautiful. You know, I'm sure Martin Luther King's activism was driven by love. My activism is not driven by love. My activism is driven by rage. Um, I'm enraged that this is allowed to happen to people and every time it happens it reignites my rage um i i do love the families um and i i want to say i love justice but i've never seen justice in my whole life um so yeah i what sustains me is my family thank god god bless me with them and then just just darian hunt um and susan hunt uh keeping a promise that I, I wasn't allowed to keep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lex, I, I think one of the uh, misconceptions or, or part of the lack of uh, awareness that, that I see in, in our community about Black Lives Matter is all of the ways in which you serve our community. Um, all of the ways in which you um, serve children in this in this state all across the state supporting children uh, supporting kids who've been bullied or brutalized because of their race um, providing opportunities for kids and for others to have spaces with other black children um, can you say a little bit about what you stand for what black lives matter stands for beyond what folks are seeing on the news well, we hold a summer camp for black children every year. We held it two years in a row in Logan. Um, there's a black church up there that o owns a lot of acreage and they have cabins and lakes and boats. And we take the black children up there. We do STEM activities. We go boating and fishing and swimming and um, we play movies for them. And I do know your rights trainings for the kids. I dressed up like a cop. Um, and, and was arresting the kids in the camp. And, um, and then we held a ski camp for black children to teach them how to ski because I said, I saw a picture of the, the ski team from Utah. And I was like, why are there no black people on this? And I'm like, okay, let's get these kids skiing. Let's teach them how to ski so they can go to the Olympics. Um, we're creating a black history museum. Everyone knows it is my pet peeve project that I hate more than any other project because we're two years in and, and like we had a meeting two days ago and I said, I said, so guys, we have like um, a date where I can send the prints to the printer. And they said, we're, we're going to try by October 15th. And I said, I said, you know, and I was joking with them. And I said, if it's not done by October 15th, I'm going to go to prison. Okay. <laughs> because yeah. Yeah. And, and these are like historians and they giggled. Um, what else do we do? We fed 300 homeless people Thanksgiving dinner on, on Thanksgiving. We um, buy groceries for black refugees during the COVID crisis. Um, we do a lot of homeless outreach and domestic violence outreach. Um, and tonight is our youth committee meeting, the first meeting ever, where I want the black and brown kids. I'm going to give them a thousand dollars that's a lot to kids and i'm going to say hey 
plan an event for the black kids. Oh, we also rented out Snowbird um, during the COVID crisis to take the kids up on the ski lift um, to the top of the mountain and we fed them lunch because we weren't able to have summer camp. So Black Lives Matter does a ton besides for police reform. Um, and it's because I grew up in Utah Black. I never got to see Black kids. Um, and I always wanted like to see them. It's 2% Black here. And, and I just always wished that I could see Black children. And I wasn't able to. So I like to create spaces where these Black kids can see each other. It's amazing. So um, a lot of our students, faculty, staff, members of our community up here in Logan want to know um, what, are the, what are the best ways that we can support your work and leadership and this movement right now? It sounds trite and it sounds overused, but it's so important that you write, email, call congressmen, senators, councilmen, mayors about police reform. Because when I'm talking to elected officials and I say, hey, can I have your support on these police reform bills? They say, oh, I, I think my constituents wouldn't like that. Well, if they're being flooded with emails from you saying, please support police reform, please support Black Lives Matter, they can't say, I don't think my constituents would like that. Like a simple email from you to your legislators helps save lives. It helps me on Capitol Hill. Um, what else? I tell everyone, look at your sphere of influence. Look at Christy. Look at Christy's sphere of influence. And I hate to say this. I am so sorry, but I have to say this. I have spoken at every university in this state, except for Snow College. Um, and my favorite is Utah State. Um, and the reason why they, you know, they brought me up to Utah State last year and treated me like Beyonce Knowles. They had handlers for me, like, and fed me breakfast, lunch, and dinner and had like a VIP sitting session for me. I mean, it was the most, it was the best experience of my life. And then I went to this other university down here and they're like, oh, wh why are you here? And I'm like, I'm speaking. And they're like, will you need a microphone? <laughs> And they put up a little paper on the door, handwritten that said Lex Scott. And like, you couldn't even see it. And I was like, wow. I was like, someone call Utah State. <laughs> I am Beyonce. So just call Utah State. Um, so you have to look at your sphere of influence. Like Christy Glass is using her influence as an educator to educate people on black and brown issues. If you're a teacher, you need to use your sphere of influence that way. Um, if you're a doctor, what's your sphere of influence? Everyone has a sphere of influence. And what they need to do is go to that sphere of influence, have tough conversations about race and police brutality and racial injustice. Um, talking about race is uncomfortable. Talking about racism is uncomfortable. Um, Utah is a very non-confrontational state where people here will do anything to avoid confrontation and uncomfortable conversations. And if you had cancer, you wouldn't go to the doctor and he'd like, don't talk about it. It'll go away. It's the same with racism and police brutality. Have these conversations and, and their number one fear is, what if I'm called a racist? What if I, if your number one fear is, what if you're called a racist? When my number one fear is, what if this police stop, they, they, I don't survive it. I never see my kids again. When I go into a job interview, I hope this interviewer isn't racist. Um, when I go to apply for a house, I hope this lender isn't racist, you know? Um, you have to have these conversations. That's what you can do for us, um, is, is find your sphere of influence, and speak to them, have tough conversations about race, um, listen to black and brown people when they say that's racist, instead of replying with, I'm not racist, my best friend is black. I'm not racist, my husband is black. My daughter, I adopted a black kid. I don't see color. Having a black best friend doesn't make you incapable of committing a racially insensitive act. Adopting a black child doesn't make you incapable of committing a racially insensitive act. My husband is white. 
He does racially insensitive things all the time. Um, you know, having a black wife doesn't make him incapable of racism. And every time someone brings up police brutality, you say, I don't think all cops are bad. We don't believe that there's such thing as a good cop or a bad cop. We believe all police are capable of racial insensitivity and that racial insensitivity leads to police profiling and police brutality and murder and mass incarceration and the school to prison pipeline. And so instead of talking about, hey, my friend is a cop down the street, he plays basketball with black kids, he gives them ice cream, I know good cops. We're not trying to target your friend down the street. We're trying to target the institution of policing that doesn't have checks and balances in place to hold police accountable for their actions. So that's just my suggestion. Please write your senators. Please write your congressmen. It's called the Justice in Policing Act in Washington. And talk to your mayors who are in charge of your police departments and say, hey, can we implement some new use of force policies, some new excessive force policies, some new body cam policies, de-escalation training, diversity training, um, and go from there. Thank you. And last question, um, what are you inspired by right now? Hmm. Well, it takes a lot to inspire me. I I'm going to be honest right now. Um, it's hard to find inspiration for me. Um, it's hard. It's hard to find inspiration. I, I wouldn't say I feel inspired since the police just went on a shooting spree this week. And every time they shoot someone, I feel like a failure. Hey, good job, Lex. You've worked for seven years on police reform and they're killing more people, more people than before you started. So, you know, I, um, I wouldn't feel inspired right now. I, I feel driven right now to change the world. Um, I'm focused like a laser. I'm not going to quit until I get it. Um, I, I feel hope is so powerful. Um, having hope for once, we've never had it. Um, we've just had doors slammed in our face. We tried to pass a, a, a ballot initiative that said, that there would be civilian review boards that have the power to investigate and bring charges against police. And then Paul Ray passed a bill saying it's illegal to create civilian review boards. You know, that's how our lives have gone. <laughs> and I got a little whiff that Paul Ray might change his mind on civilian review boards. I don't know if that's true or not, that's a rumor. Um, but that's hope, you know, that's hope. And, and, and when you pull up the utah.le.gov website and go to the 2021 session, then go to law enforcement bills and you scroll down and you see all these bills that, I mean, the tears just ripped from my eyes, like over 20 police reform bills. Are you serious right now? Like. Will they all pass? Probably not. I just need one of them. My favorite one. I'm not telling you which one. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. I need one of those to pass. Um, and who, like, I think you're going to have to carry me out of the Capitol in January. I, I will be inconsolably um, crying. And I want every police brutality victim's family up on the hill so they can finally see what justice looks like. Mm. That's powerful, Lex. And, and that's an area, it sounds like we need to t tune in and, and participate and support our legislators in getting those passed, whatever that looks like. Yes, please. Lex, thank you so much for taking the time today. And more importantly, thank you for your commitment to making our community safer and better and stronger. Um, and like I said before, you're an inspiration to me and you're an inspiration to so many others in the state for your tireless work um, in this movement. So thank you for that. And thanks for taking time out of your day to talk about your work.
Oh, thank you, Utah State. I love you guys. Um, go Aggies. And I will, I'll be up there October 22nd um, speaking at something. So I will find out the details and I will spread the news. <laughs> All right. See you later, Utah State.